Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Antonio Ginata. I'm the policy director at Columbia Legal Services. And thank you for coming to our legislative lunch. Um, as I noted, as through the introduction, we are offering interpretation in Spanish because we are doing so. We are going to take short five minute breaks at every half hour to help our interpreter rest and catch their breath. We appreciate um, your help there. So here's what we hope to accomplish today. First, I'd like to introduce you to the work, the policy work here at Columbia Legal Services. Then I'm gonna ask our outstanding policy advocates and community partners to discuss some of our priority bills. Finally, for the last 15 minutes or so after our second five minute break, we'll open the floor to questions. You'll be able to type in your questions in the chat and we'll try to go through as many as we can. But for the majority of this hour, you will hear from our advocates and our partners about four priority bills from last session. Bills protecting renters, bills protecting uh, or increasing wages for incarcerated workers, limiting or harmful system of financial, of legal financial obligations, those also referred to as LFOs, and a bill that ensures the safety and humanity of people detained in private detention centers. Speaking of our community and advocacy partners, I want to welcome um, some of them to this call. Uh, Liliana Chumpitasi, a leader and community organizer at La Resistencia, uh, Violet Lavatai, the Executive Director of the Tenants Union of Washington State, and Terry Anderson, Policy Director at the Tenants Union. I see Kelly Olson, Policy Manager at Civil Survival. I see many friends from our legal aid and social, social justice community. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. There's lots of faces in the Zoom crowd and I can't Zoom through everybody. But if Representative Gregerson has joined us, um, in case she has a special shout out to the representative for all of her work in pushing forward health equity for immigrants last session. Now, first I'd like to talk a bit about Columbia Legal Services and why we do policy work. We are a statewide legal aid organization that works to transform systems that harm low income people, particularly those who are incarcerated or undocumented. Why those communities? That focus on those communities originates from federal law, which actually prohibits legal aid organizations that receive federal funds from representing people in confinement or people without lawful immigration status. That prohibition applies if you receive $1 of federal legal aid money. That prohibition also restricts lobbying and restricts the use of class action lawsuits. At CLS, we don't take those funds. We aren't restricted by federal or state laws in the people we can represent or in the type of work that we can do. We can file class action lawsuits and we can advocate for changes in the law. So how do we decide and how do we do the work, the policy work? So at, at CLS, we can take on policy advocacy for clients if they need policy advocacy as one of their legal needs. We can take on policy work at the request of policymakers based on our expertise on the issue. And we can also take on issues that have been identified by our partners in the legal aid community that may be unable to lobby due to federal restrictions. We gather that information throughout the year. And then looking at our capacity, we develop a set of legislative priorities around late summer. So about those priorities, last, last session, our legislative priority list included several large systemic efforts. For example, we worked in partnership with community groups to successfully establish state-funded Medicaid equivalent program, uh, uh, a program for immigrants ineligible for Medicaid due to their status. Once again, thank you, Representative Tai, thank you, Representative Gregerson, Representative Macri, 
Senator Cleveland, lots of legislators who worked to make this new program a reality. We will continue working on this effort in future sessions to ensure that the program is fully funded and fully meets the needs of the community. We also worked last session in, in a similar partnership, a similar coalition to create a state-funded unemployment program for working immigrants who are ineligible for traditional unemployment insurance, again, due to federal restrictions. That work continues and will continue in next session. At CLS, we also take on defensive work. We often take on defensive work. What does that mean? It means that regardless of the makeup of our legislature, year after year, we see bills that attempt to harm or denigrate low-income people, people who are unsheltered. We see bills that diminish the voice and the strength of immigrant agricultural workers. We see bills that reinforce inequities in our criminal legal system. We work to oppose those bills. On that last particular issue, I wanna just talk for a quick second about the legislature's special session to ensure uh, to, to recodify the criminalization of drug possession in Washington state. Obviously, we are very disappointed that the legislature again embraces criminalization as the answer. That compromise, I think, knowingly ignores the deep inequities in the enforcement of drug possession statutes in our state. This is a public health issue but instead it's going to continue for the next few years to serve as a gateway to mass incarceration. We will continue to work to transform systems that create harm. Those systems include the system of mass incarceration. And we know that policy work takes time and that systemic reform is difficult, but it's work that we have to do. It's work that we're proud to do. But now, Let's talk about some of our successes during last session here in Olympia and about some of those efforts that will become future successes. First, I want to pass the microphone to Hannah Werner, one of our staff attorneys, and Liliana Chuktasi from La Resistencia to discuss our successful measure on setting basic conditions at private detention facilities. Hannah, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Antonio. Um, I'd like to introduce Liliana Chumpitasi with La Resistencia, um, and Liliana is going to share with us um, just how individuals in private detention facilities are being so negatively impacted um, by private detention. Gracias, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Yes, my name is Liliana Chumpitasi, and I am one of the leaders at La Resistencia. Uh, with almost four years of experience in this uh, detention center experience. And at Resistencia, we are a community organization, and our main object is to shut down the detention center in Tacoma, that our people are no longer detained in any of these systems. Uh, these uh, also people who are poor and we do not want them to be deported, which is happening at a massive scale. At La Resistencia, we do this work because we don't want to have people jailed in cages for indefinite times. We want uh, immigrants to be respected and to be treated fairly for all of us. That's our fight, that's our struggle, and there's no way, there's not one way just to shut it down. That's why we're trying different ways like HB 1090, which was a law that we implemented at two years ago, which is a law that prohibits private detention centers. And this law was based on a similar, similar to a law in California, that's B32. That law is, excuse me, that law uh, was uh, sued by Trump and then um, when Biden came to power, he continued it. And so uh, the states um, won because they cannot be told what to do with their people in their centers. So this is why in face of this, 
we decided to do a get a bill that forces all the agencies, state agencies that have to do with the detention centers into Tacoma. That's what HB 1470 is. So this law was worked jointly. We're talking about HB 1470, and we work jointly with people that are experienced in detention centers and in La Resistencia, like Maria, who's a mom, who has her son, uh, whose name is Santiago, who's been, who uh, is and was deported in a very unjust way, and our director, who was also detained at the center, detention center. And then based on this experience, we created the content and CLS helped us to write the, draft this bill. And this is our community-based work. And as uh, as I know about the conditions at the Tacoma Detention Center that are the worst, like when there's no inspections, you know, when there's inspections, of course they're great because they're announced, everything's clean, everything's perfect. And so those are the inspections that are dated, you know, with the time. So we like to be in contact with the detained to know about the reality that our people are facing. So just to give you some context, we receive calls and messages from detained people, and they tell us about many of their uh, many of their needs, medical needs, the wrong medications, about, among other things, bad, very bad quality of food. Uh, lots of carbohydrates, uh, processed foods, and you know, uh, sometimes people um, lose their teeth, and and we've heard stories about people losing their teeth. And there's a lot of negligence. And about clothing, they don't have a change of clothing. You know, they they I've heard that some people have the same bedding, the same sheets for a year no change of sheets. And so when they want to clean, you know, when they want to have it clean, when they are asked to clean, they're not paid the minimum pay wage. And uh, GEO, which is a company that is uh, hired and that's put people in isolation, people who protest or who ask for better conditions, it's a kind of retaliation. So those are some examples based on the experiences, not only outside, but inside in the detention centers. And this is how we decided to do HB 1470. Now we're working for the Department of Health to go in and to make this, enforce this law. So the detention center is a very dangerous place because um, there's no one way to shut it down, simple. Uh, because they have this contract with GEO, but we are forcing the state of Washington to take responsibility for this, for th that company and to uh, care for the people that are being there and are being exploited. They're exploiting people and making money off people's misery. And so this legislative action showed us that it's possible to have the people leading in policy. And we're talking about state government and to take to, you know, be accountable about what happens in the detention centers. And so we're going to continue next year and the following until the government and the state really protects the immigrants that are detained and and that could be uh, detained for years. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Liliana. Um, and hi, everyone. I'll quickly introduce myself. I did not do that before. I'm Hannah Warner, an attorney with Columbia Legal Services, and I was part of the coalition with Liliana and La Resistencia and many others pushing for passage of House Bill 1470. Uh, this bill is part of a uh, longtime effort to shut down the operation of the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma and to stop the abuses that continue to occur there. And we have been so grateful to work with La Resistencia on legislative advocacy on these issues for the past five years. Um, as Liliana explained, um, we worked together on a bill, House Bill 1090, 
to ban private for-profit detention facilities in this state that was based on a similar law in California, as Liliana uh, talked about. And um, since that time, that California law uh, ran into trouble uh, when an appeals court held it was unconstitutional. And uh, we wanted to be prepared in the event that Washington's private detention ban gets struck down um, and we have to continue to fight for better conditions at this private detention facility. With House Bill 1470, we had the unique opportunity to draft a bill from scratch alongside community that reflected community demands. Um, as Liliana um, also uh, discussed, this bill was born out of a meeting with the Lada Assistencia Coalition, um, with everyone talking and brainstorming about the changes that they wanted to see happen in the facility. And specifically, changes that could address the many concerns and complaints um, that La Resistencia um, had been hearing coming out of the detention facility from people who were detained there. And after that meeting, uh, we had a very long, uh, comprehensive list of the conditions um, in a shared Google Doc uh, that community uh, wanted um, in the facility. Um, so this um, included things like access to fresh air, nutritious food, basic personal hygiene items at no cost, free phone calls, and a prohibition on solitary confinement. Um, and this was very important in light of what Liliana shared of how people um, are being thrown into solitary confinement in retaliation for speaking out against abuses. Um, and from that meeting, uh, we also knew that we wanted certain safeguards in place, including unannounced inspections, uh, monetary penalties if the facility violates the law, and a private right of action so that community members who are detained can file lawsuits themselves against the private prison operator for abuses. So the next step was for CLS uh, to help turn that list of demands and that vision into a legislative proposal. And thankfully, we had Representative Lillian Ortiz self um, to champion the bill as a sponsor. And we worked extensively uh, with legislative staff to make sure that we had a bill that would adequately represent what the community wanted and protect the interests of people inside. And uh, to be honest, this process, it wasn't always easy. Um, we lost some parts of the original bill as it moved through the legislative process. For example, the original version of the bill would have applied to private facilities that detain youth. But we received significant pushback on those provisions in the bill, including from certain counties that utilize private detention facilities to hold youth. Um, and we ended up compromising uh, by removing those sections from the bill so that the bill only applies to uh, private for-profit adult detention. And other challenges uh, included um, some bad amendments uh, that were offered up on the Senate side that would have removed the private right of action. And this would have really limited the bill's enforcement power. Um, but thankfully our champions in the Senate uh, were prepared uh, to talk down those bad amendments and they were rejected. Um, and just um, even though the bill passed, the work is not over yet. Um, Liliana shared how we are already um, looking uh, towards implementation and how to best implement the bill. Um, the coalition has begun the process of meeting with the Department of Health, uh, which is the agency responsible for rulemaking and for inspecting the facility. And our goal is to ensure that community is involved throughout the entire implementation process, including as a valuable partner during rulemaking. Um, this is because community input and expertise is incredibly important to ensuring that the agency develops a strong and effective inspection and enforcement system. 
And in closing, I'll share my biggest takeaway, and that's when we have strong collaboration between attorneys, advocates, community groups like La Resistencia, and community members inside the detention facility all working together, we can craft strong legislation that comes out of a truly community-led and community-driven process. Um, I just would like to say thank you so much to Liliana, to all of the leadership and members of the Lateral Assistencia Coalition. It was truly a joy to work on this bill, and uh, we are excited um, to see it get implemented. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Liliana, for uh, that great information. Um, and looking forward to the continuing work. Um, as I mentioned, we are doing a simultaneous interpretation and to do so fairly, um, we are going to take a five minute break, uh, our first of a couple of breaks to give the interpreter eight uh, some time to catch their breath and rest. All right, and we are back. Thank you all. Um, let's move to my colleague, Sarah Nagy, uh, to talk about the, the long and fruitful journey that resulted in House Bill 1074. Take it away, Sarah. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sarah Nagy. I'm an attorney in our Olympia office. Um, this past session, we passed House Bill 1074, which uh, reforms the process by which uh, landlords account for charges they take out of a renter's security deposit. And um, we worked, we've worked on this for the past four sessions with our friends at the Tenants Union. Um, and I'd like to just invite Terry and Violet to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what the Tenants Union does and um, what this, what this, what working on this bill has meant from what they've heard from renters. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Violet Lavatime, the executive director of the Tenants Union of Washington. Um, we're tenant advocates um, in the state of Washington across the state. Um, 1074 was one of those bills. Um, our policy, Terry Anderson is not just our policy director. She's also our Spokane director. And her and I had a conversation in this session to um, reach out to Sarah to this year, we wanted to really um, concentrate our effort in, in passing this bill. Um, our staff has been going after landlords to retrieve some of the security deposits that they would take and they would charge on top of taking their whole deposit. We knew that this bill was important 90% of the, the, the communities that are affected are black, are black and brown communities who are working class or low income. And it was an unfair, um, it was an unfair practice that landlords were doing to the communities. Um, and so we did a lot, you know, we are not attorneys, we're, we're um, organizers. <laughs> That's what I like to say, organizers. Um, and so our job was um, to help retrieve as much as we can from these landlords, writing letters and things like that. And um, just looking at outrageous choices that, um, that were unjust. So, and I'll pass it to Terry. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Terry Anderson, and I am the director of the Spokane Office of the Tenants Union, and I also direct our uh, statewide policy work. Um, 1074 is, is really going to be amazingly helpful for the tenants that we serve. So we have a statewide tenant hotline. So tenants call our office every day with issues that impact their housing. And this is one of the most common. This I, I would say this and rent increases are our two most common calls that we get when tenants fully expect to get their damage deposit returned. And instead of getting a check, they get an invoice saying they actually owe the money. And um, we were able to call our tenants who, who call us so that they could testify and tell their stories. 
Um, I think one of the more common things that we would see is that tenants would get a invoice, an invoice saying that they owed a certain amount of money and it would not be itemized. There would be nothing specifically stated um, how the landlord derived that amount of money. And so when we do tenant workshops, um, my experience is this impacted most frequently tenants whose, whose first language is not English because they landlords could take advantage of that fact and, and write things down. And one of the most common questions I would get when I would do a workshop with World Relief or Refugee Connections is, why does it cost $80 to replace a light bulb? Because that is those are the numbers that landlords would put on um, these the cost amounts, or they'd be whole amounts, replace a door, $900 no receipts to go with it, no pay stubs, no timesheets if they're claiming that there was labor involved. And so this bill actually requires landlords to specify what the damage is and itemize how they derived the cost so that tenants aren't just arbitrarily assigned a bill. This, this actually will will save people housing because the one of the ways we would get these calls is tenants would be denied an application when they applied for housing. So now they're out the application fee. They had no idea that they would be denied. Um, this cannot happen any longer. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Columbia Legal Services. And thank you, Washington State Legislature. This, is, this bill is going to be an amazing help for the most vulnerable tenants that we serve. So thank you so much. I also got to say really quick, thank you to Sarah, who um, we work closely with. We are such a badass team together. Um, we are. Um, and so I just wanted to say that we're just excited at the tenant union 1074. We celebrate it um, amongst ourselves, <laughs> but we were just happy that this bill finally passed. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you to both of you. It's been just really great to work together. And I agree, we make a really good team. Um, I'm going to speak just a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the bill and the process of passing it. Um, we started work on this all the way back in 2019 when we started hearing from our civil legal aid partners and our tenant advocate partners that they were seeing more and more clients who had problems with their security deposits. Um, we learned that people who worked one-on-one -on -one with tenants were seeing this everywhere, all across the state. Uh, the problems, Terry talked about these inflated charges, people being put on the hook for entire remodels, people only learning years down the line that they were in debt to a previous landlord for hundreds or thousands of dollars, and they had never even known because nothing was ever provided to them about what they were being charged for. Um, sometimes they only heard about it when they tried to enter into a new lease and the tenant screening report turned up with this massive debt on it. Um, so we worked with those who regularly represent tenants in um, dispute in legal disputes with their landlords to draft a bill that we hoped would attack the problem from two sides. From the beginning of the tenancy, uh, strengthening what information the landlord is required to give to the tenant and what they have to agree to about the condition of the unit, and the end of the tenancy when the landlord sends the bill for alleged damage. Uh, from the very beginning, our champion, Representative Milan Tai from the 41st District, has been just an amazing sponsor and champion. Uh, she really listens to the renters in her district, and she felt strongly that the bill would bring fairness to a really unbalanced and unfair process. She especially believes that the bill will help immigrant communities who might find it, for the reasons Terry discussed, especially difficult to enter into disputes with their landlords uh, for fraudulent damage charges. We also got really strong support from uh, Representative Peterson and Senator Kuderer, who are the heads of the housing committees in 
the House and the Senate. Um, they were also strongly behind the bill and really worked hard with us on it. So we negotiated over four sessions. Um, we worked with public housing authorities, with private landlord organizations, um, with opposed lawmakers. Landlords were very strongly opposed. Uh, they believed that it would create too much administration. It would be a burden on landlords. We heard really heated rhetoric in floor debates about um, the belief that a landlord showing a receipt before keeping a tenant's money was going to destroy the rental market and drive landlords out of business. But finally, this past session, we were able to negotiate a version of the bill that landlords organizations didn't oppose, that is still full of strong protection. And I think this is because we heard from so, so, so many tenants over those four sessions. Uh, at the beginning, lawmakers were telling me, we, we never heard about this problem. No one talks to us about this. Is this really as widespread a problem as you say it is? Are we legislating for this tiny, tiny little group and wasting everyone's time? You know, as recently as this session, we were hearing that uh, in public hearings, but tenants kept showing up. They kept coming to the legislature and writing to their lawmakers and um, Terry and Violet and other advocates shared their stories. And over time, we simply convinced them this is a huge problem and it affects many people. Um, and so we are really glad to have passed it. And thanks again to the Tenants Union for your work. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Violet. Thank you, Sarah. Um, now we're going to go back to Hannah for our two last priority bills, both involving the criminal legal system. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. And I will uh, pass it over to Kelly Olson with Civil Survival uh, to introduce yourself, Kelly. And thank you so much for joining us. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Olson, and I am the policy manager for the Civil Survival Project, uh, an organization that is led by and for people who are formerly incarcerated. So I myself am formerly incarcerated, and these issues are very important to me. So we worked on legislation. We also help people um, with relief for some of the collateral consequences of having a, a felony conviction on your record. I'll pass it back to Hannah. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so we were lucky to work on um, not just one, but two bills um, this past session, House Bill 1024 and House Bill 1169. Um, could you share a bit about why House Bill 1024 um, which deals with um, wages uh, for incarcerated workers, why this bill was needed and what people in prison are facing without this type of relief? Yeah, so 1024, um, also known as the uh, Real Wages, Real Labor Act. Um, I think I got it right. Sometimes I switch those back and forth, but um, so really, um, you know, essentially prison labor is can really be looked at as kind of an extension of slavery or a loophole of slavery. It's basically forced labor. Um, although Washington prisons do pay, um, they don't pay very much. Um, there are other states in, in our country that pay nothing, um, but still have forced labor. So um, for most of the jobs, it's 42 cents an hour that people are making. Um, and, um, you know, it's actually pretty expensive to be in prison. And just a reminder that, you know, when you're incarcerating a person, you're not just incarcerating that individual. Um, it's the entire families that are paying the price when they have a family member that's incarcerated. So um, while you're incarcerated, you, um, you there's commissary, you have to pay for basic hygiene items. You do, if you are indigent, you do get some things 
provided for you. But if you, um, you know, if you wanted better quality deodorant, I mean, the stuff that you're provided is, is not, not very good or even really helpful actually. Um, and so you're talking about paying for, um, soap, deodorant, feminine hygiene products, um, just as an example, um, if you have sensitive teeth and need special toothpaste, um, that's $6 for a tube of toothpaste. So the things that they're charging on the commissary actually have an escalated or um, increased price on them. Um, the other thing is it's even though you're only making 42 cents an hour, um, there are a few jobs that pay a little bit more than that, um, but the most people are getting by on the 42 cents an hour. And then you also have fees and fines that are coming out of that. So your um, legal financial obligations or LFOs come out of that, the costs of incarceration, um, a lot of other um, types of things come out of that. Um, so you there's really nothing left. Um, you pay for phone calls, you pay for um, to email with your family. Essentially they charge you basically everything they can come up with. Um, you also, there's also um, punishment or ramifications if you don't, if you refuse to work. So um, an example is, you know, you might lose privileges to visit with your family or visit with your kids. Um, and a big reason why this was important to civil survival is, um, although we tend to focus on reentry issues, we believe that reentry starts on the inside. Um, and so although the, the bill started out asking for wages to be brought up to minimum wage, um, we knew that that was a bold ask and we wanted to start there. Um, plus it helps kind of get some attention on the issue and shed a spotlight on just the conditions that people are working in. But we believe really strongly that, you know, if the people are inside and they're working um, and this bill had a mandatory savings um, component to it, um, that then when you get out, you would have a savings account to be able to um, set yourself up and kind of have a foundation when you are released um, that the current model does not um not afford for. So again, we just feel that the people are working, um, they should be compensated. And this is one way to um, provide them some resources and a little bit of financial footing when they are released to start a successful transition back into the community. Um, and I'll pass it back over to Hannah to go over some more of the details of the bills bill and kind of what happened with it. Thanks so much, Kelly. Um, and just wanted to say that CLS was very excited to be invited by the bill's sponsor, Representative Tara Simmons, um, into this coalition with Civil Survival to advocate for House Bill 1024. Um, when we joined, there was already a really strong draft bill that clearly aligned with CLS's mission and values and our ongoing work to investigate and end economic injustice issues within the prisons. Um, and it also made sense for CLS to jump in to support this important bill because of our longtime work with client communities who uh, are working within outdated and racialized employment systems that are built on these exclusions or loopholes that uh, Kelly mentioned that cut low wage workers, many of whom are workers of color, out of basic job protections. And in response to requests from our community partners and the prisons, um, CLS had already been looking into issues related to the Department of Corrections, uh, DOC, uh, correctional industries, uh, and other work programs. And we had been hearing numerous concerns from community members who are incarcerated related to those deductions from pay that Kelly explained. And combined with 
the ever increasing prices at the commissary store, you know, what we were, were hearing um, is that people in prison, like Kelly mentioned, are really being squeezed from both ends. They don't have enough money left over to pay for basic necessities um, like soap and, and toothpaste. And one major challenge that we faced this past session with this bill was, and, and with other bills as well, um, was just a grim budget outlook. House Bill 1024 had a high dollar amount attached to the bill. In the fiscal note, uh, DOC estimated approximately $130 million would be needed to pay workers who are incarcerated higher wages, including paying the state minimum wage for workers who are employed in correctional industries. But if we look at the fiscal note another way, that roughly $130 million represents the profit that the state is potentially making off of what is essentially modern day slave labor. Um, as Kelly explained, this unjust system, it's a continuation of that 13th Amendment um, provision that allowed or allows forced labor as punishment for a crime. Um, and for hundreds of years, this system has incentivized the mass incarceration of people of color and the exploitation of their labor by not paying workers in prison a fair wage. And I'd like to quickly share some telling details, uh, another telling detail from the fiscal note. And that's the, the Department of Licensing estimated that it would cost an extra $5.4 million per year to pay workers in prison who make license plates, the state minimum wage. Uh, currently, workers who make our license plates are only paid about $1.51 per hour on average. Um, given the fiscal situation, uh, the sponsor and the coalition agreed to compromise language with DOC in order to keep moving forward with some relief for workers. This included giving up the state minimum wage requirement for certain workers and instead requiring DOC to pay workers in correctional industries no less than $1.50 per hour, which sadly is still higher than what most workers earn. As Kelly mentioned, the vast majority of people doing work in the prisons are paid just 42 cents an hour. Um, despite taking compromise amendments, the bill ultimately died, waiting to be called to the House floor for a vote. Thankfully, Rep Simmons is a very fierce champion for her bills, and she kept fighting for higher pay for workers and eventually succeeded in getting a small pay increase through a budget proviso. And that proviso sets aside $3.5 million per year for DOC to increase wages to no less than $1 per hour for workers employed in the uh, class three unit porter jobs. This demonstrates another valuable takeaway. Uh, even if your bill dies, it might be possible to pivot and look for some relief through the budget. Uh, in closing, I'll just share very briefly uh, something we have coming up next related to this issue. CLS is currently conducting a survey with our partners in the prisons on labor, wages, deductions, other issues that touch on their economic well-being. Um, and our goal is to publish a report before the 2024 state legislative session to inform policy adv advocacy moving forward and to continue raising awareness about these inequities. And now uh, I think we can switch gears and talk about House Bill 1169 related to LFOs. And so I will hand it back over to Kelly um, to give us uh, a little background on what House Bill 1169 does and why this relief matters so much to communities. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so 1169, uh, again, it was um, dealing with legal financial obligations or LFOs. And um, a big 
big reason why this bill is so important. We've actually been working on LFO reform for almost a decade now and have been really chipping away at it. Um, the last mandatory fees and fines, um, previous years we've gotten rid of other ones. So the last mandatory fees and fines were the victim penalty assessment or the VPA, the VPA which was $500, and then the DNA fee collection, which was $100. Um, all other fees and fines um, are discretionary based on an ability to pay. And so um, the reason why this bill is so important is most people who are going through the criminal justice system are unable to pay these fees and fines. And at the end of the day, our court systems are um, a phrase often used is that we're spending dollars to collect dimes. So the reality is we're assessing these fees and fines to people who can't afford to pay them. We know, um, as was mentioned in the previous bill, there's huge racial disparities in um, the criminal justice system and who is charged and who is assessed, who ends up being assessed these fees. And it, you know, it it tends to um, affect the um, Black and Indigenous Indigenous communities more than any other community, um, and it when you have these fees and fines, you are essentially trapped with your conviction for life. You can't pay off, or you can't vacate a record, or get out from underneath the history side of it until until you've paid off all your fees and fines. And again, as I said, we know that most people going through are not able to, um, to pay these fees. The VPA fee is a fee that goes to the prosecutor's office to provide victim advocate services. Um, so it, it helps survivors of crimes as they're going, as a case is being prosecuted. Um, and then the other thing, um, that the DN and then the DNA fee is the Washington State Patrol does um, does the DNA test and so they keep a database for that um, and so part of the bill also was to backfill that money from the state so that those services are still available um, to survivors of crime and felt that it was more important that those services be provided a reliable funding funding source versus trying to incorporate all of them into um, rather than relying on people who can't afford to pay for them. And so I'll pass it over to Hannah to um, outline some of the challenges and some more. Um, yeah, I'll hand it over to Hannah. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so um, we knew going into the 2023 session that we needed to meet with the chair of the Senate Ways and Means Committee uh, to understand what VPA and DNA fee relief had been removed um, from the previous bill and what we could do to help House Bill 1169 succeed. Uh, thankfully, Chair Rolfes joined one of our coalition meetings. Uh, we learned that we didn't have a policy problem necessarily, but we did have a money problem. Um, Kelly mentioned that cost of replacing the revenue um, at roughly $4 million per year. Um, and so uh, in light of this, um, and this is one of the challenges that we faced um, that actually turned into an opportunity as was that we ended up accepting an amendment offered by Representative Cheney on the House floor that significantly changed the bill by eliminating the VPA only for youth and adults who qualify as indigent. And after this change, the bill was tied to an ability to pay standard for adults seeking relief, uh, a standard that we had successfully broadened through House Bill 1412 so that more people could qualify for relief underneath an expanded definition for indigency. Um, and so even though that compromise narrowed the bill, it also effectively reduced the fiscal note which helped us to solve one of our biggest obstacles with the bill, which was that $4 million dollar per year price tag. We were able to later um, effectively um, persuade uh, the fiscal committee that we could reduce that number based on those changes to just 
around $1.8 million per year anticipated cost. Um, and so I would like to um, just uh, think about some of the coalition dynamics that came into play. Um, another opportunity that came along in the Senate um, is when our strategy and coalition shifted and we joined forces with the Debt for Youth Justice Coalition. And so Kelly, could you talk about how that came about and the impact that it had on our advocacy efforts? Sure. So they had a bill um, that was focused just on youth debt um, and it incorporated um, getting rid of fees and fines. It had some restitution portions in it and some other things, um, and it did not make it through the Senate. And so we had been supporting each other's bills. And then the idea came up that um, after their bill died, that they would join forces with us and try to take on some provisions from theirs. And uh, specifically what we did, as Hannah mentioned, is for adults, those fees are still there based on an ability to pay. But for youth, it was completely eliminated. And then also back debt for youth was made uncollectible. Um, and so being able to join forces um, really helped us because we had a huge champion in the house being representative Simmons. And um, going over to the Senate, we did not have a companion bill, but this other youth bill had already gone through the Senate. And so we had champions over there that really helped us to um, kind of get this bill over the finish line. Thanks so much for that, Kelly. Um, and I think I, I and um, so as we close out talking about House Bill 1169, um, we can share some takeaways that we've had um, from this experience. And so I'll share two. Um, one major takeaway from this is that um, it pays to pay close attention to fiscal notes um, and revised fiscal notes. Um, as we were able to um, play around with the numbers when we got that revised fiscal note and argue for a lower budget impact, which really helped us pass this bill across the finish line. And also having folks in your coalition who are numbers people, um, like we had with Evan from the Washington State Budget and Policy Center, just to do a shout out, um, was truly invaluable. Um, second, um, when you have dedicated coalition and community support, Incremental reform can really pay off. Uh, House Bill 1169, as we've heard, built upon the victories of House Bill 1412, which in turn followed successful reforms in House Bill 1783. Uh, it took nearly a decades long effort, but we can now say that indigent defendants in our state will no longer be sentenced to mandatory LFOs without the possibility of seeking relief um, based on their financial circumstances. And so I will uh, pass it back to Kelly uh, to share what are your main takeaways from this session and what are some of our next steps uh, since the bill has passed? I'll go really quickly because I know it's time for a break. Um, basically just one, don't give up. Um, to sometimes accept incremental change is one of the ways that we can continue moving forward because it builds on the conversations um, and then just being creative and having really strong community partners. I'll Thanks. End Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Hannah. Um, uh, we are going to take our second interpreter break. Um, now, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And when we come back, we'll spend the last 10 minutes or so trying to answer those questions. Thanks so much. Hey everybody, we are back for our Q&A and our closing. Um, we have about seven minutes. We do have one question from, from Terry Price. Thank you, Terry, for your question. Um, question read the LFO collection. County clerks and DOC have a complicated system for LFO data sharing. Um, have you heard whether the system is working? Are their LFO, are their LFO accounts accurate? I'm, I'm just uh, shortening the question, but uh, Hannah or Kelly, any thoughts on Terry's question? Um, yeah, I'll try to take a little bit of a stab at it, but um, I would agree that the our, our court systems in general um, are, are not great. Um, and so as far as 
and um you know as far as making sure that the accounts are accurate I definitely would um recommend that people you know get a full accounting once they are released of how much they paid while they were at DOC and double check that with the clerk's records at the um at the county that they owe at um which is complicated and um there are some organ you know civil survival is one of them that has attorneys that help people with their um legal financial obligations um so if you're um able to to have an attorney help you, I'd recommend that. But um, I guess the quick answer is, is I don't know that they're super accurate and I don't know that I would trust them myself. So keep the, you know, get the records from DOC and double check them against the clerks. Thank you, Kelly. I see another question about solitary confinement and why aren't we getting these protections for everyone? Thank you, Virginia, for that question. Um, I'm going to take a quick shot uh, just to make sure to, to make clear there is a large coalition of groups working to end solitary confinement in Washington. It is a very difficult lift. Um, I know that the budget included, I think, $5 million to move towards the reduction of the use of solitary confinement, but it does so with the hiring of more staff. And so there's this push and pull that is tricky, whether we want to increase the carceral footprint and increase the number of staff to reduce solitary confinement. Um, we are supportive of the work uh, to end solitary confinement. The ACLU is one of the groups that is more closely aligned with that work. As to how we got it into this bill, um, good advocacy, good sponsors. And I think we wanted to get our foot in the door to say, if we can do it here, we should do it across the board. Um, I don't think I see any other questions. I wanna thank you all for coming. Um, I want you to please continue to follow the groups that spoke here today, our community partners, support their work, please. You can join our CLS email uh, list by going to our website and signing up there. You could learn about events like this one in the future and get our, um, postings on the work that we are doing. Um, your feedback on these types of events is always welcome. So please do send, if you have any questions, comments, uh, please send them to communications at columbialegal.org. That's communications at columbialegal.org. Before I end, thank you so much to our interpreter for doing this work. It is um, important and difficult and we appreciate you. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the afternoon.